You are watching a non-science popular video about harmful sugar. I don't understand anything about chemistry and human physiology, but I know what happens when big business starts to influence politics. And I know how politics can affect people's diet. My name is Fred. Fred Maximoff. This is case 3476. United States of America, our days. Throughout the 20th century, the sugar corporations and confectioners systematically reshaped our eating habits. Transnational companies ordered scientific studies that were beneficial for themselves, concealed data on the dangers of sugar, and imperceptibly planted humanity on a sugar needle. The recent epidemic has greatly reduced the income of the population, but sugar does not care. The rise in sugar prices has only continued. The real rise in sugar began after the Second World War. In the United States, the fast food system began to take shape. The well-being of the population grew and the abundance of sweets in the diet began to be considered a sign of prosperity. But simultaneously with the growth of prosperity, humanity suddenly began to suffer more often from cardiovascular diseases. There were no clear reasons for this at the time. However, scientists have found something that united all the sick. It was love for what would later be called wrong food. In this trend began to be suspected of fats and of course carbohydrates. In the middle of the 20th century, American physiologists came to the conclusion that peoples who eat less animal fat are much less likely to suffer from diseases of the heart and blood vessels. Professor Case, who declared a vendetta against fats, then became a real star of science. His portrait was even printed on the cover of Time magazine. These scientists were opposed by their British counterparts. They decided that sugar was to blame for problems with metabolism and diseased blood vessels. But suddenly, those scientists who dared to speak out against sugar were less likely to be invited to various scientific conferences. The grants they received for research were cut. The fight against animal fats has become fashionable. Those scientists who did not agree with this were condemned and deprived of the right to speak. But we all understand that fame, relevance, and the opportunity to be heard are no less important for scientists than for musicians or artists. Put yourself in the place of those who wanted to speak loudly about the dangers of sugar, but someone influential prevented them from doing so. Thus fats officially fell into the category of dangerous. The food industry quickly adjusted and fat-free products appeared on the shelves. But the problem is that fat-free foods become tasteless. Then, for the sake of increasing sales and the taste of the product, manufacturers began to add even more sugar to the composition. Behind these decisions was the powerful sugar lobby. When the first evidence of the harm of sugar for the body appeared in the 50s, industrialists seriously thought about it. After all if this continues, then in addition to scientists, news about the dangers of sweets will be spread by journalists. Then the food magnates made a decision that changed the rules of the game for a long time. They began to bribe scientists. The company, Sugar Research Foundation, was engaged in this. This non-profit organization was responsible for issuing grants to scientists in exchange for the desired research results. In the 60s, they gave a grant to researchers at Harvard to study the effect of sugar on the human body. The authors presented to the public a large report in which the effect of sugar on the deterioration of human health was declared minimal, but at the same time fats were named the main cause of coronary heart disease. However, the authors forgot to point out one fact in this report. It was a fact about how much they received from their customers. The amount was $50,000. In modern terms, this amount is $400,000, although for the invaluable work for the industry it is not a pity for more. It was America's leading research university, reputable scientists. At the time of publication no scandal arose. Only 60 years later this information became public. Everything became clear thanks to the published correspondence of scientists and those who generously sponsored their research. And the most curious was one of the last letters. In response to the text of the article, the customer writes the following quote. Let me assure you that this is exactly what we had in mind and we look forward to seeing this report in print. When representatives of the Sugar Research Foundation were asked how it happened that no one knew about anything all this time, 
Then they just said that then the standards of transparency in the work of scientists were not as high as they are now in the 21st century. In fact, it was an admission of guilt. Sugar lobbyists have been deceiving the public for 60 years, and if it were not for the publication of their correspondence, no one would have known anything. But if you think that these practices were left somewhere in the days of Elvis Presley and the Hitchcock films, then I will disappoint you. In 2015, the editors of the New York Times came across very interesting emails. According to this correspondence, the Coca-Cola company actively sponsored the study of American scientists with one simple thesis, it's not about what you eat, it's about how actively you move. The idea that a calorie is a calorie has become the mantra of those who want to convince consumers to ignore the amount of sugar and carbs in general. Simply put, lobbyists have tried to push the idea that it doesn't matter how the body gets calories, from broccoli or chocolate, the main thing is to burn as many calories as you consume. But a couple of years ago it became known about another practice of Coca-Cola. The staff of the University of Cambridge decided to find out how the food giant affects the research of scientists who work in those government institutions that Coca-Cola sponsors. It turned out that as soon as the employees of the corporation noticed that the conclusions of the study about the dangers of sugar and the danger of obesity could damage their business reputation, scientists were put under direct pressure, up to the threat of termination of the sponsorship contract with their institutes. Not only could this adversely affect sugar research, but funding for a dozen other research programs could also be at stake. There are many such stories. For example, a study from Coca-Cola and Pepsi on the dietary effect of soda, even more dietary than from water. A study by lobbyists for candy makers Skittles and Hershey's that proves that kids who eat more candy weigh less than those who don't. It sounds comical, but people trust scientific research. It is clear that it is impossible to change eating habits instantly, but if you constantly come across news for several years that sugar is not so harmful and those who drink soda become slimmer and do not suffer from diarrhea, this will definitely affect the fact that you put it in your shopping cart at the supermarket. So who is behind all this? In fact, there are many such people. Let's name them. Robert Kwok, the richest man in Malaysia, the owner of the Shangri-La hotel chain, made his capital on sugar processing. Aliko Dangote is the richest man in Africa, owns the lion's share of the entire sugar industry in Nigeria. His conglomerate is the third largest sugar producer in the world. Jean-Claude Mimran, also known as the sugar king of Africa. It is considered the largest private employer in Senegal. His company is so powerful that it has created a new city. The Senegalese town of Richard Toll, after the expansion of the sugar industry, has grown 30 times. And finally, the Fangel brothers are American billionaires of Cuban origin, the owners of the huge Fangel Corporation. To strengthen their position, this family is extremely active in American politics. Elder brother Alfonso is a major donor to the Democratic Party. In 1992, he helped Bill Clinton become president. The younger brother Haas is in charge of the opposite flank. He makes contacts with the Republicans. He was one of the key sponsors of George Bush Jr. and Donald Trump. The Fangel brothers not only helped Trump get elected in 2016, but also donated half a million dollars to his inauguration. As a token of gratitude, they received a restriction on cheap sugar from Mexico which dumping prices. The bet played not only on Trump, a well-known fighter against big business and predatory capitalism, socialist Bernie Sanders in his election campaigns took great pleasure in receiving money from sugar corporations and defended their interests in the Senate with the same satisfaction. As you may have noticed, the sugar magnates prefer not to put all their eggs in one basket. Because the state has to work under any government, Fangel Brothers companies are accused of bringing in illegal migrants and using child labor in the Dominican Republic. And this is happening today, in the 21st century. Slavery is formally gone for a long time, but women and children are in semi-slavish conditions in order to get more granulated sugar. According to official figures, since 2014, the sugar industry has spent at least $10 million a year on lobbying its interests. If we add to this the costs of companies with a strong interest in protecting sugar, such as soda or chocolate manufacturers, we get an amount of more than $100 million that is spent annually. If you look at the packaging of goods in the United States, then the daily intake of fat and cholesterol, sodium, and so on is written on it. 
but you know what has no daily intake. At Sugar, corporations were able to prove to the state itself that the division into added and natural sugars is based on nothing. And that's why, in the daily norm for sugar, there is no point. So it was until 2021, when common sense prevailed and the label was changed after all. In fairness, it must be said that not all politicians agree to cooperate with lobbyists. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg launched a crackdown on soda and sugary drinks in public places 10 years ago. In response he was hated. The sugar lobby launched a campaign against him named, Bloomberg Nanny. The mayor was portrayed as a billionaire, who with his unhealthy overprotection, prevented ordinary New Yorkers from living in pleasure and the sugar workers won. After Bloomberg left the post of mayor, the New York court recognized his action as an abuse of power. The sugar lobby is practically omnipotent. Corporations at the expense of consumers receive enough money to influence politicians and prevent the progress of anti-sugar laws. It turns out a vicious circle. People consume sugar, and the producers of sweets spend their money on ensuring that no one bothers them to consume it. In the U.S. sugar companies continue to feel more than confident. Because each state or city in the U.S. can impose its own taxes, since 2009 soda producers alone have spent more than $200 million defending themselves against sugar taxes. In Philadelphia, Chicago, and San Francisco, the opponents defeated sugar but such victories only come about in big cities or deeply urbanized states. America is a country of small towns and here sugar still reigns supreme.